All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending our session. It has been a wonderful day today. So I first want to give uh, V a hand, please, for setting us all up together. Anyway, just, just a quick uh, thing. You know, this morning, I think Dr. Wooten had said that, uh, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then um, tell them uh, what you told them. And I, I wish I had her as my attending. My attending goes, be there be quick and be gone. So that's a whole different uh, that's, that's section. But uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kalak. Uh, Dr. Kalak is a uh, member of the Indian Health Council. He's been there since as a CMO, as you can see, big letters, uh, uh, since 2003. Uh, he graduated from Harvard um, for med school, much smarter than me. Uh, and he did uh, his residency med ped, so not just one, but two at USC UCLA. Uh, he's been there. He was a recipient of the award for the Indian Health Council, and uh, he served out his four years, plus he stayed 14 more years. So that is dedication. Um, so it is my pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I won't read the rest of it. He told me not to read it, but it's huge, all the stuff that he does to give back to the community. But it is my pleasure to in introduce Dr. Dan Kellick. Woo. Thank you very much. So it's... Uh, it's great to be here, actually, and uh, we're going to kind of twist it up a little bit and more focus on some clinical uh, aspects, maybe even for the medical students or uh, also for the clinicians in terms of uh, what uh, public health and what we see out in the community. Um, I think some of the people I mentioned, Dr. Wooten had mentioned regarding um, some of the data that is not uh, well received uh, from these outlying areas because there's no uh, posts out there, but we're going to uh, talk um, briefly about uh, some of those vulnerable populations, a lot of the same stuff you've seen today, but uh, more with a Native American twist. Um, I'm going to reference the uh, shirt here off to the side of the table. I put that out to commemorate the uh, the people in Lahaina and our brothers and sisters that are uh, not with us today, and of course the suffering that uh, that, that occurred over those that uh, that short time period. So uh, I was going to wear the shirt, but it's a 2XL, and so I'd be a little tight um, uh, today at this point. So moving right into the slides. So um, many people are really astounded about you know, how many Native Americans are really in the United States. So uh, depending on who uh, you're counting, it's anywhere between six to 12 million, but we'd like to use that number six to uh, seven or 47 million uh, across the United States. Interestingly, uh, California, Southern California, especially are home to more per capita Native Americans than anywhere across the United States. Now there are more Oklahoma, there are more um, people in the Southwest, uh, the Apache, the Navajo, and people in Oklahoma in terms of numbers, but in terms of tribes, there are 31 distinct tribes south of Los Angeles, and there's over 107 different tribes in the state of California, comprising the total number across the United States, 574. And that number is growing uh, all the time. So really diverse population here, you know, in the area. Um, how does that really relate to uh, our talk today? And so this is our take home slide. So for the medical students and or practitioners in public health who uh, have that twist in their, in, their, in their practice, this is the take home slide that you really wanna you know, look at and apply to things like uh, climate change. Why? Because each one of these is actually applicable to uh, uh, considerations with uh, temperature change and climatic uh, uh, changes that we're encountering. We talked about transportation, for example. How do we get people to cool zones? Many times they can't walk, or why would you want them to walk you know, through 100 degree heat? Um, health literacy, uh, the people that we spoke about previously about running around at two o'clock in the afternoon, um, the importance of making sure they understand those body uh, changes and how important it is to, as we said earlier, drink enough water. So this is a really important take home slide for us to, uh, to reference uh, regularly. So uh, we talked about cool zones, we talked about uh, uh, green infrastructure. So this is the green infrastructure that is, is, is in the East County. So this is actually a uh, frame from a sweat lodge that sits in the back of our clinic. And um, this also is the same similar structure that exists for people who are in the East County. This structure will be covered by branches and bows of willow to uh, provide a shade, shade structure. So if you can imagine yourself 100 years ago, probably sitting in this structure in the dead of heat, 
uh, trying to stay cool, kind of prostrate on the ground where it's you know somewhat cool. And this is this is uh, the kind of heat people are still encountering uh, at the uh, in, in the East County, especially where I work at. Does anyone know where Harris Rincon is? Anyone been out there? A couple of hands, a couple of people. Harris Rincon. It's about uh, 40 miles due uh, northeast uh, of here. And when you see the weather reports and it says, oh, it's going to be 90 in Escondido, it's always 10 degrees hotter in uh, in this area near Harris at the mountains. You see the mountains in the background. We talk about the Santa Anas and how. The, uh, the air comes over the top, rushes down the mountains and compresses, it gets hotter. That's where this location is at. So if you can kind of envision that and what those public health needs for these populations are. Um, this is my cool zone. So this is a uh, 50,000 square foot structure, uh, size of a Costco. Uh, this is where I work. But this uh, provides multidisciplinary service to the populations in those areas. We serve uh, nine of those 31 tribes um, where I'm at. They're from uh, uh, Pala, for example. Everyone knows the casino-related uh, uh, tribes. Pala, Palma, Rincon, uh, Santa Isabel, and there's other four tribes in the outlying areas. But this is where the cool zone um, uh, exists for our populations in that area. So we talked about you know, data. We saw a lot of data slides here. It's really difficult to get good data around American Indian Alaska Native uh, uh, groups and, and trends. Why? There's a variety of reasons why. Many, many times it's a geographic, financial, socio, uh, social, cultural you know, issues. And obviously sometimes a distrust for people who are coming around the area asking questions. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect this, pop this population. Um, Dr. Rubido, Yvette Rubido, who was the former Indian Health Service director um, in uh, 2004 to, I think, 2010, uh, cited this in one of her uh, papers uh, funded by the Commonwealth Foundation, um, noting that uh, you're getting that data to really document the, the need and the, the other health disparities that exist for these populations is difficult at best. So what about those vulnerable populations? So we, these next couple of slides we've talked about, but um, I'm referencing back to the initial slide regarding the health literacy components, the transportation issues, um, but trying to sit down and really uh, provide a practical knowledge base for the patients you're seeing in your office. Why is it that global warming or a climactic change is so important? Describing to them the reasons why um, uh, these points on this slide are so important and pertinent, not only to themselves, but also to their children and uh, their, uh, the next generations uh, to come. Sitting down with them and having these conversations, uh, talking about the, the people who are still working at 50, 55, 60, and then uh, advising them to slow down, recognizing that they think they're 21 and they're still working out in you know, 100 degree heat. Um, hopefully you make that connection, but really having those basic health literacy um, pertinent conversations with them looking at their age, looking at their cardiovascular system, looking at their kidneys are not, you know, as vigorous as they used to be when they were 20. Recognizing, as Dr. Bailey has said, that their lungs are not as uh, vigorous and efficient as they used to be when they were 21. These are conversations that I'm having with my patients and then we have as clinicians with our clients because you really need to break it down for them to make sure they understand and they take away something that, that is meaningful uh, versus something that um, is uh, more, of course, evidence-based, but again, that they can take home and tell uh, not only their, um, their loved ones, but also their children as well. The children. So um, we owe a great debt to UCSD and the NICU and other NICUs around the area uh, because they take our uh, 28, 35, 36 weekers, ex preemies and you know, they you know, take care of them, make sure they're ready to go and they come out to where? To the area that I just mentioned in terms of that extreme heat, right? And so they're not in air-conditioned homes. Hopefully they are. They can come to the cool zone that, that I had uh, referenced earlier. But, you know, these kids, along with other, other children, um, you know, have these same uh, 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 risk factors in terms of uh, exposures, air quality. Uh, a lot of people remember the fires that were here in 03, 05, 07, when... Um, uh, 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 the the area that was uh, that sits or the area that area that uh, the valley where Rincon um, uh, Harris Casino sits it's a big bowl and I remember coming to work uh, the day after the fire and just I mean it was like a big big fog I mean I couldn't I couldn't even see 
more than about maybe 50, 100 feet in front of me. And then people were still coming in for their appointments, health literacy, physical exam appointments. I go, go home or just go, go to the coast, but don't come and don't stay in here. They're breathing, you know, all that smoke. So this, you know, definitely impacts not only the, um, the, the population at large, but also the, their children. And then um, the other component to this is the uh, psychosocial stress, you know, to this community. So this is a community, uh, much like other communities, who may have uh, a long-term psychosocial stress that uh, maybe has an epigenetic component uh, to that. So these populations who have already been stressed over the past 500 years uh, due to historical trauma, you know, what, is it, what's, what does it mean when you have climactic change and uh, episodes and events like uh, the pandemic that they had to live through? So this slide kind of resents the norm, right? So getting back to uh, the norm, um, where we have just, you know, just so many flu illnesses, you know, 60,000 a year, people passing away from flu, or, you know, the other visits related to just normal flu, uh, to flu uh, illnesses. This is actually worldwide. But it's, um, it's something kind of interesting to actually refer to this as the norm, because now with climactic change, we need to think about how that's going to be affecting our populations uh, a little late, uh, uh, moving forward. So, and uh, uh, specifically regarding these high-risk groups. So not only children, pregnant women, those asthmatics that we spoke about, and that's where that health literacy kind of comes into comp to play as well. And, uh, you know, having seen a child who comes in, and this child was obviously struggling to breathe, you know, a five-year-old, like, oh my gosh, how long has your child had asthma? And then my kid doesn't have asthma. Like, oh my gosh, yes, he has uh, has asthma, and but that's why they have always breathed. Uh, um, so that that's the kind of health literacy components you want to make sure that uh, that we're seeing in some of these rural areas. But as we um, as we have advances and the ability to work with our partners like UCSD, like Kaiser, like other major hospitals in the area, and patients are discharged home, we have to make sure that they're protected from uh, these episodes of uh, 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 weather extremes. This slide actually represents the uh, potential for anyone getting ill uh, related to uh, climactic change. So everyone in this room, I can confidently probably say, has at least one of these issues uh, affecting them. And if not for the, uh, thankfully, they're not very serious, hopefully, but um, just, re just regards to obesity. Uh, you know, fighting obesity is something we have uh, nationwide, something I struggle with as well. As well. I also have asthma, but looking at that and how it relates to uh, weather change is, is uh, important when it comes to that health disparity and the health literacy components. So when you're talking to clients and they're, you're advising them in terms of their, the membranes that are drying out uh, during the, uh, the weather changes, severe weather changes, and the, the ability to stay hydrated and how that puts you at increased risk for, potent, uh, for potential infectious diseases like, like the common flu is something that... Uh, the, the, uh, the ongoing conversations for your patients need to be aware of um, uh, when you see them in clinic. Um, I like this slide because this slide, uh, and, and it seems like every, every time you have a client or ever have an infectious disease or a at-risk population, there's these populations and you have um, the American Indians somewhere, oh, sorry, halfway through. Uh, halfway through the bottom there. So if you're American Indian, Alaska Native, or actually if you're someone from, you know, uh, at, at a high-risk group coming across the, uh, the border, or if you're in an um, a inner city home with over 10 people um, in that home, you're at high risk. So um, again, this is the take-home slide for the, for the medical students um, uh, and, and the practitioners, just making sure that we, we really think about uh, factoring into what we're telling our clients uh, when it comes to climactic change. As we've seen in the, in the news, as we've seen you know, over the past couple, uh, uh, five to 10 years, uh, not everyone can afford a, uh, a hybrid car, electric car to kind of, uh, to reduce those, uh, those emissions. Um, not everyone can afford the, uh, the, the, the air conditioning that we had seen uh, that, is, um, that uh, may be you know, financial or uh, dependent in terms of uh, the ability to get uh, some of these structures. So um, applying this uh, template from the CDC Health Equity Guide is a great way to really kind of uh, make sure we're covering all the bases as it pertains to uh, climactic change in our patients. That is it. Thank you, Dr. B.